UIUC. So Professor Khan is one of the two co-directors of the C3.AI Digital Transformation Institute, uh, which is uh, headquartered at University of Illinois and Berkeley. And it also consists of several uh, top universities. Uh, so um, this institute actually aimed at uh, promoting research on AI and machine learning and the uh, internet of things and cloud computing for the betterment of society. So Professor Inkan is also uh, the Frederick G. and Elizabeth H. Nearing endowed professor of ECE uh, and the coordinated science lab uh, at UIUC. Uh, his research interests are in machine learning, uh, communication networks, uh, and applied probability. So he's the winner of the 2019 IEEE uh, Koji Kobayashi uh, Computers and Communications Award and the 2017 Applied Probability Society Best Publication Award. Uh, and uh, the 2015 IEEE Infocom uh, Achievement Award and the 2015 uh, Distinguished uh, Anonymous Award from the, the Indian uh, uh, Institute of Technology Madras. Let's join me uh, in welcoming him. Thank you, Joran and Changhan for this uh, uh, invitation. I'm, uh... Uh, delighted to be oh, here, although I would have liked to be there in person. <laughs> it's unfortunate that we cannot, cannot meet. Um, uh, so today I'm going to be talking about load balancing in bipartite graphs. Um, this is a joint work. The primary author is Wentao Weng, who is, a, if you can believe it, he's, a, he's, a, he's going to be a senior <laughs> at Tsinghua University. So he visited me earlier this year. He's from what some of you may know as a Yao class at, at Tsinghua. So he came actually on the day, I think he landed on the day when actually flights from China were uh, uh, not allowed. From the next day, I think he, he may have come on the very last flight to the United States at that time. Uh, uh, now, of course, you know, they don't allow the US, <laughs> US flights to go in probably, but, um, and with Xingyu, Xingyu Zhao, who's a, a PhD student at Ohio State University. Um, so this talk is about um, data centers and cloud computing, and I'm sure all of you know what cloud computing is. So cloud computing is used by almost all major uh, companies that we hear of these days, um, Amazon, Google, um, Microsoft, everything. So uh, so cloud computing is, is uh, powered by data centers. Data centers have lots and lots of computers. Uh, and, and so this uh, introduces a a new type of problem. Um, so you have large numbers of servers, a large network, massive amounts of data. So there are all kinds of problems ranging from cloud computing data centers to machine learning. And uh, uh, I, I work on both the cloud computing or data center aspect of it and the machine learning aspect of it. Uh, um, but but today I'm gonna to talk about talk about data centers and I was, as I was telling some people earlier on, I'm gonna be giving another talk at Northwestern. So I just thought I didn't want both talks to be on machine learning. Uh, with, to a different group, I guess you have a Tripods Institute, so, so I'll be doing that in a month or so. So today's talk will be about cloud computing and data centers. And the goal is to design algorithms or characterize delay performance. So for people who I know in machine learning is a hot topic today, so for people working in machine learning, you can think of what I'm going to talk about is, is how to schedule the machine learning workloads that are generated within data centers. So this is a classical load balancing problem that many of you may have seen. So you have jobs arriving to a data center and you have lots of servers. So you have N servers. And the goal is to figure out uh, uh, where to route the jobs, okay? And, and uh, uh, so, so, so here, the, the, the gold standard in this is join the shortest queue. So a job arrives and then, and then there's something called a dispatcher, which is another computer, which looks through all the servers and figures out which of the servers has the least amount of load. So in this case, it would be this server. Of course, this is totally empty here. And so you would, you would uh, uh, send, it to, send it to that server. Uh, um, and and uh, uh, of course, the problem is when the, when the number of servers is uh, very, very large, like you know, tens of thousands or even some people say hundreds of thousands and millions in certain data centers or groups of data centers, are co-located. So there's been an interesting problem that people have been looking at for 20 years, which is to figure out how to reduce the complexity of uh, join the shortest queue. In join the shortest queue, if you have 10,000 servers, you have to constantly keep monitoring the workload in each one of them and figure out which of the servers is the least amount of 
jobs and then try to route your route your uh, uh, job to that server. But that means that you have to constantly get feedback from 10,000 servers letting you know, you know, you know what their workload is. And so there have been beautiful variants of this basic idea that have been studied. And one of the first ones was actually the mid 1990s, well before data centers existed. Uh, 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 I'm not sure what motivated them to study the problem. And this is a beautiful example of why fundamental research turns out to be useful many, many years later. Uh, 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 they just looked at this problem and then and the solution was by, you know, uh, provided by Vedenskaya, Dobrushin and Karpilevich in Russia and Michael Mitzenmacher in the US in two independent papers. Uh, what they suggested was let's randomly sample two of the queues uh, or D queues, and actually two turns out to be you know does the job pretty well. That's called power of D choices. So you that's or power of two choices. You're sampling just two queues. You randomly sample two queues and then you know route the job to the shorter of the uh, uh, to, to to the uh, amongst these two servers, whichever one has fewer jobs waiting. You route it route the job to that that particular server. And, and many many variants of this uh, uh, basic idea. Uh, some are significantly different, some are, some are similar, have been studied, and one of the more popular ones recently by my colleague, Yi Lu, is, is called Join the Idle Queue, and then, and then there's something called batch filling, and so on, okay? But there is a sort of, a, if you really look at what data centers do, there is a, I wouldn't call it a flaw, but there is a limitation of the model in the previous page, okay? And I'm gonna explain, try to explain what that limitation is um, um, in the slide. So you, it's true that you have thousands of servers or sometimes some people say Google you know, data centers now have millions of servers. It is true that you have millions of servers. So, so, so you might think that you know, N is like, you know, let's even say it's 10,000 servers. So N is potentially 10,000. So it's a relatively moderate sized data center. You might have 10,000 servers, which is very, very large. And you know, getting feedback from all 10,000 servers all the time, figuring out what their workload is could be, could be onerous. But, but if you really look into the uh, uh, sort of the machine learning or the data science aspect of it, when a job arrives, so each, each, each job here basically requires some data to execute. So, so an example of a, a job would be, you might be interested in counting the number of occurrences of the term presidential election in news stories on CNN yesterday. New, news, news stories in CNN are not stored at every server. They're only store, stored in some servers in Google or wherever, whatever uh, uh, um, search engine you use. So, so it's not like you can send the job to any server that you want, okay? So you can only send, it, send your job to a limited number of servers, okay? So, so even though there are lots of servers, the amount of choice available to each, each job is limited, right? So, so for purposes of reliability, Amazon, Google, all of these people will, will actually replicate the data in multiple places. So you do have some choice, but the choice is not the entire data, set, data center, okay? So similarly, when you type a query on Amazon, uh, actually one of my uh, uh, students, uh, um, um, uh, another one of my students, not the one that I'm mentioning here, uh, not the ones I co-authored papers with here, but my, one of my PhD students actually did, a, did an internship at Amazon Berkeley last spring and, and uh, he gave me this second example. And, and he basically said that when, you, when you, you user types in a query to Amazon, the query is routed to a subset of servers. You try to figure out which server has slightly loaded and amongst the servers that can actually execute the, uh, uh, some machine learning model and get you the answer. So it's not like every server that Amazon has is basically you're, you're, you're allowed to route, route a query to, to, to all of these servers. So, that is, so, so, so when a job arrives to a data center, it is not like you have uh, uh, full freedom. You don't have full flexibility in routing your query you, or, or your job, and, and you only have limited flexibility. And so the main purpose of my talk is to sort of differentiate myself from, from this type of an analysis, which is beautiful, where, where the goal is to figure out if you have full flexibility in routing jobs to all servers in the network, how should you sample from this to reduce the overhead? So that's, that's the work that people have been looking at for 20, 25 years now, okay? What I want to look at is, is the problem motivated by what is called data locality. So the data that you need to execute your machine learning model or your, or your query resides in only a limited number of uh, uh, servers. So every job only can, can send, can route itself to a limited number, to a few servers, maybe, maybe 10 servers or 20 servers or something like that. Uh, and the question is, 
uh, uh, is that flexibility enough for you to get very small delays? So one of the great things about joining the shortest queue routing and when you have lots and lots of servers is that you practically get zero queuing delay in the system. So, so what I'm showing here will, will not happen. So you'll basically have only one job at the most in each server. And N becomes very, very large like in practical systems. If you have full flexibility, you can route the job to any, uh, whenever you're looking to route the job, you'll probably find a free server all the time, okay? So the question is with limited flexibility, is that still going to be true? So is that clear? So please feel free to interrupt um, and, and uh, uh, ask me questions. You can just unmute yourself anytime you want and, and uh, please feel free to jump in, okay? So are there any questions on the motivation? Okay. So, um, so this problem load balancing with locality was actually, uh, has been studied uh, also for about six years. And again, but my model is a bit different from what, what people have studied in the past. So what I want to uh, um, first tell you how, how people have studied this in the past. Um, so, so here, just for illustration purposes, uh, a job of type green is arriving at, at this node. What I mean by that is that this no, this job requires green data to, to execute. So it can be routed in my model. I'm gonna assume that it can be routed to this server which has the green data or this server which also has the green data, okay? I cannot route it to this server here. The server is not allowed because it doesn't have, does not have green type of data. Uh, but unlike this, the other models that have been studied previously all assume that you can still route it on this path. So you can still route a job that arrives here that requires a green data to this server. The assumption that they make is that if you route it to this server, then this server takes a longer time to execute the job than the other two servers, simply because it has to either pull the data from here or from here, and that takes some time to execute. It. So their modeling assumption is when a job arrives, you can route it to anybody in the network, Okay, you would prefer to route it to a, a, a server that has the data, but because, but, but if all the servers that have the data have a lot of jobs already waiting, you might prefer to route it to a server which does not have the data, but that server will then be allowed to pull the data from somewhere else. It has to search through the data center, figure out where the data is, and that actually typically increases the uh, um, um, amount of time that it takes to uh, um, serve a job. And, but, but maybe sometimes it is worth it because if all the other servers are very heavily overloaded, it might still be worth it for you to pull the job uh, from some, somewhere else and then pull the, pull the data from somewhere else and execute the job. And so, so this, this would take a longer time. So, so the question is, you know, what is the trade-off here? And that's basically what all of these uh, uh, um, other papers that I've cited here, uh, which is still ongoing work. I've just cited the first three papers on this topic and, and uh, people are still working on that model. So the model I'm going to assume today is that I'm just not going to allow any routing at all. In practice, uh, uh, data locality people, you know, most algorithms do not, do not that's, that's an option, but most, most algorithms that are, that are implemented today, today do, not, do not try to pull the data from somewhere else, I mean, or at least they try to avoid it as much as possible. Um, so the first work of this type to, to try to model data locality is uh, was this beautiful paper by Mukherjee, Borst, and uh, Lou Warden. Uh, Mukherjee is uh, somebody who just recently joined, I think last year, joined the industrial engineering department at uh, Georgia Tech. He got his PhD, at, uh, I think, from CWI at Netherland, in Netherlands. So that's that's where he did this work. And and so in this model, so you have jobs arriving to various nodes in the network, and then they model data locality using edges in this graph. So basically a job arriving here can only be routed along this edge or this edge, okay? And, and they assume the arrival rates of uh, uh, um, jobs to every node is constant. And they assume some uh, assumptions, which depending on your viewpoint may or may not be reasonable, but I think it's a reasonably good starting point. Assume Poisson arrivals to each node and exponential uh, service times for each job. And then they show this result as the size of the uh, uh, network becomes large. If the graph is sufficiently connected, roughly speaking, I think the graph connectivity 
I won't get into it. I'll get, get into it a little bit more when I talk about my result. But I think something like uh, um, login connectivity, just like a random graph, for example, uh, a standard or Dasha new random graph with, with, with the minimum number of edges uh, needed for connectivity would work. So in that setting, what they show is that you can actually get zero delays. So the only, uh, um, I'm sorry, zero waiting time, the only delay you'll experience in the network is just simply because you have to, you have to process the job. But, but otherwise, you never wait. I mean, there's always a free server amongst your neighbors and, and, and you, get, you get zero delay, which is a beautiful result. It's a powerful result. Um, however, the assumption uh, misses one key point about this data locality, which is each node can potentially be, I mean, every computer or, or, or every uh, entry point into a data center can actually generate jobs for Anybody, I mean, so it's not like, uh, um, so for example, um, so, so if you have a job of green, type green that arrives at this node, so let's say this is the node that we are focusing on. And if a job of, the job of type, uh, type green arrives to this node, then you can route it to this along this path or this path because both of these servers have the green data, okay? On the other hand, if there's a job of type yellow that arrives. You cannot route it on these two. You have to route it along this path. You cannot because these two job, these two neighbors don't have the data. So the connectivity of the graph itself is different for each data for each uh, for each type of job. So therefore, assuming a single uh, 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 type of graph doesn't fully justify the kind of model that I was talking about. So what you really need is to model multiple graphs, one for each color or one for each type of job that drives to the network. Okay. So to do this, we borrowed a model for, uh, uh, um, from this paper by, um, um, I'll mention in the next page. Uh, so basically we assume, so you can ignore the uh, picture on the right and I think the picture on the left is sufficient. So the picture on the left basically says that I'm not going to worry about where the jobs are generated. That is actually irrelevant to me. So I'm just going to think of there are three different kinds of jobs in this data center that are generated in this data center. Each job type corresponds to the type of data that it needs to access to execute it itself. And wherever, independent of where the job is generated, you know that a green job has to go to only these two servers. So this is a group because this has green type of jobs and this has, sorry, green type of data and this also has green type of data. Whereas if it's a yellow type of job requiring the yellow type of data, then it can only go to this server. And this purple one can of course only go here. Okay, so if you think of job types abstractly as just the left nodes in a bipartite graph and, and the, and the uh, uh, servers as, as uh, the right nodes in a bipartite graph, the connectivity of the bipartite graph tells you where certain jobs of certain types can be routed to. So I don't have to really, actually this is surprisingly, this is a more general model. So this is not, I mean, even though the previous work that I mentioned connects, considers a general graph, actually a bipartite graph is a more general model, which basically the bipartite graph is just that you don't consider, so, so the previous model, the nodes, the, tr the nodes are simply the servers, which are this. Here I'm just introducing a, a, a set of fictitious nodes which just stands for the different type of jobs that are generated in the network. And by the way, the left-hand side and the right-hand side don't need to have the same number of nodes here. The number of different types of jobs in a data center is probably far bigger than even the number of servers in the data center. Uh, um, um, so the left and right nodes don't have to be the, have to have the same, same number of uh, uh, elements, the same number of nodes. Yeah, so this is our model. So, so we start with the bipartite graph and to uh, uh, um, I'm, so jobs arrive to nodes are, ge are generated by nodes on the left, and and you only have the ability to route them along the edges that connect the left node to the right node. Okay. Okay. So so uh, um, so in this setting, so there's this paper by Cruz, Jonkier, and Schneer, who are also the first people to introduce the model who then studied the following problem. So let's say we just do join the shortest queue. So even though, even though uh, uh, this is not um, uh, a fully connect, I mean, so, so it's not like in the first model that I introduced where when a job arrives, you can send it to anybody you want. In that case, you know, join the shortest queue gives uh, uh, zero delays or zero waiting time. So this is, a, this is just, let's just say that we still do join the shortest queue in this, in this network, even though it doesn't have full 
uh, um, uh, full flexibility. By join the shortest queue, what I mean is here, when a job arrives here, you can only join the shorter of these two queues. You can't touch the other queue. You can't go to the other queue. So you only do join the shortest queue amongst the servers that, that you can reach. OK? And, and they didn't study whether this system give, give, gives you uh, uh, small waiting times or not. They just came up with a condition, which actually can be written in terms of a max four min cut problem. Uh, um, and, and they showed that if, if there is a solution to a certain max flow min cut problem, uh, uh, then, then, uh, uh, then, then you have uh, um, um, basically, uh, uh, that, that's the largest stability region for this problem. So basically the queuing delay would be finite. So, so if, if a certain max, uh, um, max flow problem has, has uh, um, a solution, then, then um, um, if the arrival rates, uh, uh, so okay, okay, maybe maybe I can just, uh, I won't talk about it. So basically what they say is that they relate. So the question they asked is, what is the vector lambda that can be supported by this network? And then what they show is that if there is a solution to a certain max flow problem, and, and this lambda is compatible with the solution to that max flow problem, then, then the network can support this. But, but it doesn't say that the network can support this arrival rate with small delay. It just basically says that the delay will not be infinity in some probabilistic sense. Okay. But, but primarily what I just wanted to, why I wanted to mention this paper was, this is the paper that, I, that sort of interviews this model that I mentioned here. So we have a bipartite graph, jobs are generated on the left nodes and you're allowed to route the jobs to, uh, to, to any node to which the left node is connected. So that's the model, okay? My goal is not to just figure out which set of arrival rates can be supported in this network, but my goal is to figure out under what conditions can you make the waiting time go to zero, which is what you're really interested in, okay? So we are interested in more than stability. So we asked the question is join the shortest queue still optimal for this system in the sense of can it make the uh, a mean response time, uh, a small response time, latency, total delay, these are all the same things. Uh, basically the amount of time from the time the job is generated to the time the job leaves the system. And, and uh, um, we will provide solutions for the case uh, that n goes to infinity where the number of servers in the systems becomes large. But we'll also provide bounds when the system, is, when the, uh, uh, system size is not infinity, but large but finite then we can still give a bound on the mean response time. So in the limit as n goes to infinity, you, we can prove that the mean response time is the smallest possible and the waiting time will be zero. But, but if we, we can even provide solutions even for the case um, where n is finite, okay? So the case n goes to infinity is sometimes called the mean field limit. So we are basically for finite n, we are giving you, and we can provide bounds on, on the deviation from the mean field limit. Okay. So our main result is the following. We impose a condition called well-connectedness. And under well and the well-connectedness condition, we show that join the shortest queue has, has asymptotically zero delays if the servers are homogeneous. Meaning if all the servers have the same processing rate, of course, different computers have different processing rates. Some computers are faster, some are slower. But if all servers have the same processing rate, then join the shortest queue has asymptotically zero delays. But there is some a variant of join the shortest queue, which I'll call join the fastest of the shortest queues. And this is actually asymptotically optimal. This is a property that's stronger than uh, 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 zero delays. Not only uh, uh, gives you zero delays, but it actually prefers to join the shorter, uh, uh, okay, so what is this before I explain what it is? So let me, let me before I explain the result, let me tell you what join the fastest of the shortest queues. It's obvious from the, from, the, from the description. So if you have two queues that are equally, that have the same number of jobs, you will route your, uh, um, job to the server, which is faster. Okay, so that's join the fastest of the shortest queues. It's a small variant of join the shortest queue. And, and so in this case, for example, in the example that I've shown, both queues are empty, so you will join the faster, faster queue. So you might wonder, how do I know how fast a, a server is? Okay, because I mean, in practice, it's hard to know how fast a server is. I don't actually need to know how fast a server is. I just simply need to know which server is faster. So if I have two servers, which I know one is a something about paying a lot more money and because it's faster than I would route it to that. So I just need to know the relative uh, 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 speeds of the servers. I don't actually need to know which server is fastest. Okay. So this is a, so we proved that join the fastest queue is, 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 is not only does it achieve zero waiting time. It actually is, uh, uh, gives the smallest response time. And the, and the reason is that uh, uh, even if you have zero waiting time, but let's say you're, you're routing jobs to this, 
server, when this server is also empty, the first server is also empty, let's say you're still routed to the jobs to the lower server, clearly your, your, your delay will be larger because this is a slower server. For the same size job, this will take twice as long to process than this. So the two here is this processing rate of server one and one here is the processing rate of server. Okay. So what we prove is join the fastest queue is asymptotically optimal for heterogeneous servers. Uh, optimality in what sense? Uh, uh, There's a cost it, min, min, Minimizing the response time in the limit as n goes to infinity. So this is the surgeon time? Yes, sojourn time. Okay. Yeah, mean sojourn time. Yeah, correct, exactly. Yeah, mean total delay in the system, yeah. Is that clear? Yeah, okay. thanks. And additionally, we also provide a delay bound for finite systems. And so that's the summary of the talk. And I'll try to get through uh, some of it at least. Okay, so I wanna mention that there's contemporaneous work by uh, Rutten and Mukherjee, who studied a similar problem. Their, 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 their uh, results are different and their uh, um, um, assumptions are different, um, but, but it is similar in spirit. They also studied a large a, a, a network where you have data locality, um, but, but the modeling assumptions, for example, I'm gonna assume finite buffers because in practice my buffers are finite and, 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 and the analysis technique we use is something completely different. Uh, but, but I think it's a, uh, Ratan and Mukherjee is a very, very nice paper. We actually found out that uh, uh, just before we submitted our archive through a mutual uh, acquaintance that, that, that they had they had done the same work. So we decided to exchange emails with them and, and uh, both, of, both the papers are on archive. Okay, so this is the model. So in addition to what I mentioned earlier, so I'm gonna assume the buffer size is finite because I think in practice buffer sizes are finite. And so, so, so I'm gonna assume buffer sizes are finite. So therefore, in addition to characterizing delay, I also need to show that in the limit as n goes to infinity, there is zero loss. So no, 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 no job gets thrown out. Um, and uh, so we are, we, um, for simplicity, I'm going to present the result, assuming that all the servers have, have uh, 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 the same processing rate. Uh, in this case, join the shortest queue works, but otherwise you have to do join the fastest of the shortest queues. Um, but I'm going to allow the arrival rates to be um, uh, heterogeneous. So different types of jobs have different, different uh, um, uh, arrival rates. So just a quick, uh, um, um, slide which just explains some notation. I hate to do this actually. I don't like to put up a slide with notation and then use it later. So I'll try to remember to explain the notation when I need it. So N is the number of servers. So SI is the fraction of servers with at least I backlog jobs. Okay, so, so the number of servers with greater than or equal to I jobs in the, uh, uh, including the job in service. That is what I call SI or it's a fraction. So divide that by N. So if I sum up all i greater than or equal to one of si, and that will be the total number of jobs in the system. Okay, so this is the main thing I wanted to mention in this slide because several of the results will be in terms of this, this quantity here, okay? So, so uh, uh, for, uh, sorry, this should be a small. So since the arrival rate is lambda, since, since the jobs are arriving at rate lambdas, uh, or n lambda because there are n, uh, sorry, so if, if, for example, if, for example, the total arrival rate is n lambda, so the sum of all the lambda i's, let's say, is, is n lambda, I guess I forgot to say that. Okay, number, of, the total arrival rate is, let's say, n lambda. So, so the arrival rate per server is lambda, so you would expect the fraction of servers to be busy, that are busy to be lambda. If lambda is the arrival rate, uh, the rate at which jobs are arriving, and, and each job stays in the system for one unit of time, you would expect on average the number of servers that are busy to be lambda. But actually, I'd like the total number of packets in the system or, or the summation to be equal to lambda. That would essentially imply you have zero delay, okay? Uh, uh, sorry, zero waiting time. And, and the, the only delay will be the processing time. Uh, the, uh, the, as, as Ohad called it, the sojourn time is waiting time plus processing time. Uh, but but basically the waiting time will be zero is what I want to show, okay? Okay, so our main result is the following. So we make what is called a well-connectedness assumption. So on, uh, um, 
under the well-connectedness assumption, so what I assume is that if I consider any subset of the graph, okay, any subset I'm going to call A of the graph, oh sorry, of, sorry, of the, of, the, of the servers, okay, and if the subset of servers is sufficiently large, then the number of left-hand nodes that are not connected to it is small. So in this case, if I look at these two nodes on the right, then the number of uh, 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 servers that are not connected to it is very large, but that's because I'm not considering enough number of servers on the right. But if I consider enough number of servers on the right, if I consider a large pool of servers on the right, then the number of jobs that are not connected to it should be small, and in this case, it's zero, actually. Everybody on the left is connected to servers two through n. So this is the assumption that I need. So my result will be in terms of this parameter d tilde, okay, which tells you, which, which measures the number of servers on the left that are not connected to right-hand side sets, and the right-hand side sets are sufficiently large. The result is this. So this quantity, as I mentioned, which is the total number of packets in the system, the expected value of its deviation from lambda, which is its ideal value, will be of this form. Okay. Um, let's ignore what epsilon is, and the blocking probability is 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 in this form. So I think this is, is a bit hard to interpret. So I, I wrote it slightly differently here, uh, or took a special case. That's a very general result. So for example, if the buffer size is log n, okay, if there are n servers in the system, you want the buffers to be not that large, and let's say it's log n. It also works for even finite buffer sizes. Things have to be uh, uh, modified for that. If the buffer size is log n, and most left nodes are connected to most right nodes, that is what the d tilde is measuring. But by most, actually, you don't need that much connectivity, but let's, uh, I'll explain that a little bit more in the next slide. Then the waiting time in the system goes to zero, the blocking probability also goes to zero. So this is the main result. So, so in this particular case, we can show that the response time is actually close to one and the limit as n goes to infinity. And for finite time, actually, you can provide a bound on, on the mean response time for finite n. Okay. Um, so I wanted to talk about what the connectivity of the graph means. So, so uh, uh, we can show, uh, again, this is too much notation. So, so let's say you have left nodes that randomly connect to log n of the right nodes. So each node on the left is connected to log n of the right nodes. Then in that case, all our results are, you know, all our assumptions are satisfied. It's actually even satisfied even more weakly. But that is a sort of a sufficient condition. That's sort of roughly the uh, uh, um, uh, um, regime that, that you want to think about. Okay. Uh, so basically, if there is some minimal connectivity, not minimal, I mean, of course, there should, you need, you need well-connectedness. But well-connectedness doesn't mean that every left node is connected to every right, right node. So if, so if you're connected, even if the connectivity is sparse, but that's sufficiently dense. It can be sparse, but it should be sufficiently dense, and sufficiently dense is not a significant uh, 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 requirement here. Um, but, but more importantly, we can actually provide precise bounds for finite n for all of this. So we can say these are the bounds that we get for blocking probability, these are the, uh, um, these are the bounds for, for response time, and so on. Okay, so let me pause here. So this is the main result, and in the remaining time, I'll give you some intuition about why the main result. So are there any questions? So the main result states that if the left nodes are uh, um, sufficiently well connected to the right, which means typically, you know, one would think of the our, our sufficiency requirement as essentially a very sparse graph, actually, and, and uh, not very sparse graph, but but, but I mean, not, not a very dense graph certainly, and and in that case, just doing doing join the shortest queue, even though you don't have access. So you, basically, the main result is that your choice is limited. Okay, you have very limited choice here, but despite that, you can get close to uh, um, zero delay in this network. Okay. Okay, great. So let me move on. So the proof sketch roughly works like this. So we, we take a system which is a bipartite graph, 
and eventually convert it to a system where there's only one left node and one right node. So basically we show through a middle transformation which sort of uh, um, takes that system and then approximates it by this system where there's one left node and multiple right nodes and eventually basically say that, um, uh, say that you essentially have a, a, a one left node and one right node. So the system, the system on the left behaves very much like the system on the right. And uh, this is a term that people who work on queuing theory use, resource pooling. So lots of resources together pretend like they act like a single resource. So in our case, we also have demand pooling. So the nodes on the left also act like almost like a single source. So this is the basic idea. And for a single server queue, if the, uh, if, if the arrival, I mean, if the, uh, uh, yeah, so you know, most of you probably know this result. If, if the capacity of the system is large and the arrival rate is large, then, then the uh, uh, expected number of waiting jobs is going to be small. Okay. So uh, um, it turns out that for classical load balancing, we join the shortest queue. As I mentioned, the total number of, uh, um, the fraction of servers that are going to be busy is going to be lambda equal to the arrival rate or, or the scaled arrival rate. And the number of servers with greater than or equal to one, with greater than one job waiting will be zero. So what we want to show is that our, our result essentially mimics this. Okay. So now I'm going to get into a little bit uh, uh, of the details of the proofs and so on. Let me just check how much time I have. Uh, okay. Um, so, so my favorite method for solving problems is what I call the drift method. Basically, if you have any Markov chain and, and the Markov chain is in uh, uh, is in steady state. So, so if the Markov chain is in steady state, then any function of the of the state of the Markov chain, the expected value will not change over time, right? Of course, modulo caveats such as this expected value should be finite, otherwise the statement doesn't make sense. But but ignoring that, any given a Markov chain, any function of the Markov chain is not of the state of the Markov chain is not going to change from time instant to time instant in steady state. So, so around 2012 or so, we uh, introduced this as an idea to prove heavy traffic optimality of, of uh, uh, queuing systems. So, so uh, by heavy traffic optimality, what we mean is the arrival rate is sufficiently large that the system is going to be uh, uh, close to an overload situation, but I mean slightly underloaded, but, but very close to full loading. So in this case, the system size, the queue lengths would be very, very large, but then even this large queue length is asymptotically optimal in some sense in, in this large regime, in this, in this large arrival rate regime. And, and uh, before that, people used to study this using you know, connections to fluid models and, and uh, uh, Brownian motion techniques. So we introduced this uh, other way of looking at it where we basically said, I mean, this is a well-known idea, that this particular idea of studying, you know, of course, everybody knows that expected value of any function of the state of a Markov chain does not change in steady state. But the question is, how do you use that to study heavy traffic uh, 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 behavior? And what we said was, so, so this, of course, builds on decades of work by many others over time. So one beautiful observation in the applied probability literature is that in heavy traffic systems we exhibit what is called state space collapse. So, so for example, if you look at join the shortest queue, there are n queues, but, but since you're trying to balance the load, you're trying to route jobs to the short, smallest server, essentially you're trying to equalize the queue lengths. So it's as though the system lives in a one-dimensional uh, space rather than an n-dimensional space. To describe the Markov chain, you need to know the workload in each of the n queues, but it turns out that since you're trying to make the queue lengths equal, if I tell you the queue length of one queue, it is as though you know the queue length of the other queue, roughly speaking. So, so essentially heavy traffic analysis uh, uh, exploits the fact that a large dimensional system actually lives in a much lower dimensional space. And so our main idea was instead of studying, suppose Q denotes the Q length vector of, uh, 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 in a system. So what we, what we do is you project the Q length vector onto this lower dimensional space and that's what I call QS. QS is the projection of the Q length vector onto this lower dimensional space. And, I, and the norm square of that is what I'm going to use as my function, which whose expected value doesn't change over time. And, and to actually, so this will work if the perpendicular component is small. So I'm assuming that the Q length actually lives in the lower dimensional space. 
but that is only true if the per perpendicular dimension is small. <clears throat> and to prove that the perpendicular dimension is small, what I do is that use the, use the norm of the Q length on the in the perpendicular space. Okay, the perpendicular component. I'm going to assume that I'm going to prove that that actually decreases over time in expectation, at least. Uh, actually, so there should be conditioning here, conditioning conditioned on the current Q length. So the so so there's a drift condition that needs to be satisfied. And if the drift drift condition is satisfied, then there's classical results by Hayek from 1982. And uh, and uh, improved result by Bert Seamus, Gamarnik, and Sitziklis from 2001, who which can be used to prove that expected value of uh, um, this perpendicular component in steady state will be small in some sense. Steady state. Okay. So that that was our key idea. But you don't have state space collapse in 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 our system because I'm not going to assume the system is uh, in heavy traffic because heavy traffic doesn't make too much sense for cloud computing systems or data centers because Amazon and, and uh, uh, Google and Microsoft want to operate the data centers with practically zero delay. So, so uh, uh, there was this paper by Liu and Ying who actually had many of the similar ideas but beautifully imported them into this light traffic regime where you want to have zero delays. They studied a similar problem to what I'm studying except that they assumed full flexibility. So the very first problem that I mentioned, a job arrives, can be routed to any server server that you want. And, and uh, uh, what they show is that even in this uh, light traffic regime, okay, so uh, 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 there is something like state space collapse. And, and what they show is that if the number of jobs in the system is large, then this implies that the number of servers is large. Okay, so you cannot, you cannot, uh, maybe maybe I have a picture somewhere. Yeah, so you cannot have a, a data center if if the data center employees join the shortest queue. For example, you cannot have a situation like this, or the situation will occur very very rarely. So what is the situation? The system the, the situation. There's a large number of jobs in the system, but they're all collecting in one server. That cannot happen. Okay, so this is what you have to prove. Okay. It's taking longer than. Uh, uh, what I thought, so I, maybe I won't go through the uh, 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 technical details. So the basic idea is that, so when will a system behave well? A system will behave well when it is, when it is actually, uh, 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 I mean, all the servers are, are empty but processing jobs. So it's, if exactly one job is waiting in each server, that's the best, that's the ideal scenario. How do you prove that that happens? So we, we, we use a funky Lyapunov function to do that. Um, so I don't know. Yeah, so we use this Lyapunov function. So this Lyapunov function is actually a, a equation way of stating what I have in this picture. Basically what you need is that if you look at the number of jobs that are waiting in the system, if this quantity is large, then the number of empty servers must be small. Okay, we want to prove this. And, and the way we prove it is that you start, you start a, use a Lyapunov function, which is the minimum of the total number of waiting jobs in the system and some quantity, some other quantity, okay? And this quantity, with a little bit of thinking, one can show that this, this Lyapunov function is large only if the number of jobs in the system is large or the number of servers in the, in the, in the, uh, that are being used is large. Otherwise, uh, um, um, this, this cannot happen. So, so without you know, going through the details of the proof, maybe I'll skip. Some of these, I have a, 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 a too many equations here, so I'm going to try to uh, uh, try to explain this intuitively. So the basic idea is that if there are number, the number of servers is very large. Suppose you have a lot of lot of packets waiting in the system, a lot of jobs waiting in the system, but uh, but also you have a lot of empty queues. Okay, so suppose you have a lot of jobs, but also you have a lot of empty queues. So basically, which would be the situation that I'm this situation. This is not a good situation. But if that were to happen, if the number of empty uh, uh, queues is very large by my well-connected assumption, if this is a significant fraction of the total number of servers, then the arrival rate here is also high. And so, so therefore, this, these queues will fill up very quickly. Okay, so therefore, the situation will, is, is, is sort of unstable. I mean, you cannot, you cannot be in the situation. So automatically, this may, the only situation that you can be in is basically essentially each queue 
can have only one job in the system, uh, or more precisely, mathematically, this is what this is what we want. Okay. So we can extend this to heterogeneous servers. So instead of join the shortest queue, you can do join the fastest of the shortest queues. And that turns out to be uh, um, optimal <clears throat> from the point of view of sojourn time or also called response time. The proof is more involved. Um, so I wanna finish my talk in roughly 50 minutes. So if there are any questions, we have, we have time for questions. So what I'm going to do is again, skip these slides, but, but the, uh, uh, um, basic conclusion is, is uh, uh, with bipartite load balancing, join the shortest queues optimal for homogeneous servers, okay? which means you have asymptotically zero delays. And, and we can give a delay bounds for finite time systems, but join the fastest of the shortest queues more optimal. But even when you have log n servers, some people might say that this is too expensive. You know, you have to search through all the servers to figure out. I mean, all your uh, uh, all the people you can route to and figure out which one is the which one has fewest number of jobs, and you have to figure out amongst them who's the fastest and so on. But all the results that I mentioned today actually extend to what is called join the fastest queue. So I'll join the fastest of the idle queues. Join the fastest of the idle queues uh, is a service discipline that's actually much easier to implement. implement and actually, this was uh, uh, invented in, in Microsoft. So actually, one of my colleagues, E. Lu, was one of the inventors of this idea. But when she was doing a postdoc at Microsoft, she, she and uh, her colleague, Albert Greenberg, and a bunch of other people came up with this idea as an alternative to join the uh, uh, shortest queue. So their algorithm is called join the idle queue. A small variant called join the fastest of the idle queues actually Everything that I said uh, uh, works for that, but I just didn't want to explain join the idle queue because I didn't know if everybody would, would know what it is. So join the shortest queues easier. I thought many people would know that. Um, so, so everything that I mentioned can be extended to join the fastest of the idle queues. Um, so ongoing work, I just want to uh, conclude with a slide. Uh, so, so, so I, I associated with each server a certain processing rate, which I call mu one j. But, but the amount of time that it takes to serve a job might actually depend on the data that it requests. I mean, if you if you're sifting through uh, 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 news stories in CNN, it might take a certain amount of time. Whereas if you're sifting through all, through all news stories in the world, then of course it's going to take much longer. So basically, different jobs that access the different servers may have widely variable service requirements, okay? So, so which is not modeled in what I did, what, what I, the model that I presented. So, so I modeled almost every other aspect of data center. The one aspect that I left out was the fact that different types of data have, have, may have different processing uh, uh, requirements. And um, um, so I don't know if we can extend our work to that particular scenario or not, but I believe that we can, and we are, we are, we are uh, working on that. But if we are able to do that, that will essentially complete this work, but that's a somewhat of an open problem at this time and uh, the three of us are, are working on it. And uh, if, if there is an update to it, we'll uh, um, post it on archive. So that's it. So I guess it's uh, 50 minutes and I'll, I'll stop it now um, and take any questions. Thank you. Any questions? We can stop sharing. Yeah. So I have a question. There's a paper by Gamarnik and a student, uh -huh. which I forgot the student's name. You know about the heavy traffic for the JSQ? Uh, so actually, David was at a talk that I gave in the supply probability group just a month ago or so. Uh, and he did mention this. I haven't looked at it yet. So what, what is in that paper? But I think it's a different regime and everything, right? It's a completely different They model. call it QED regime. I'm not sure if it's really, if they can really call it QED, but it has similarities with the QED. I see, I but see. But they also show that, uh, as far as I remember, because I looked at this paper a long time ago, but they also show something like, all, asymptotically, all the servers will have um, at most one, I think. Uh, that's right, yeah, that's what David right? said, correct, yeah, exactly. So it's, uh, what, where's the differences uh, exactly? So, I, so did, did, he do, did he do join the, so, so I have limited flexibility. 
So when a job arrives, I cannot route it to any, any server in the network. Each job type can only be uh, routed to a small subset of the uh, uh, servers. Okay. So I don't know if, if, if uh, David's work uh, had that feature or not. No, I think it was just JSQ. Right, right. So that is, that is so, so uh, uh, yeah. So our, our work is completely different because, because of that. So that makes, so the question we are asking is that, what is the amount of uh, uh, choice you need for you to get zero delay? And, and so uh, it's somewhere between JSQ and the supermarket model, right? You have more flexibility no. than the supermarket model? No, we actually have, uh, oh, so, no, no, we have less flexible. Supermarket model also has full flexibility, except that you're, you're only randomly sampling a few. Yes. You right. want now, to, like now basically two. I'm actually restricting you to only go to a few, few, few uh, uh, servers. Okay. So from the outset you have just. From, uh, yeah, basically because, because, because the data is only, so certain types of data reside, I mean, you, you, each type of data is replicated in a certain number of servers, but that's it. Those are the only ones you can go to. So, so it's totally limited. I mean, there's no, there's no real choice. I think, I mean, I should actually look at a paper by, um, I forgot about that, by uh, Kuang Shu and John Sitsiklis. They talked about limited flexibility in one of, the, one of their papers. I should look at that, actually. Um, but, but yeah, so, um, um, yeah. So I think the models are all different. And also we assume finite buffers. So, so because we thought that's more realistic and so. But you never, it doesn't really matter asymptotically, right? It doesn't matter asymptotically. It doesn't matter asymptotically. But I think that for the details, it does matter. So, for example, Ratan and Mukherjee use, yeah, probably doesn't matter if they look at their proofs and you know, change, change stuff. But certainly, we assume finite buffers. And, and we don't go through the process level convergence type of results. We directly obtain bounds on steady state. So, there is no, there is no establishing. Um, uh, some Brownian limit for finite T and then doing an interchange of limit and things like that. We directly work with the, uh, a steady state and get a bound. So this, but this is not new to this work because I've been doing this for <coughs> several years now. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Okay, well, if there are no other questions. Well, let's uh, thank Professor Srikan again. Thanks so much for coming. Thank you very much for showing up and uh, hopefully see, I'll be able to see some of you in person at some future time. <laughs> thank you, bye. Thanks, bye. Thanks so much, bye.